All right, today's lecture is on classification. And like always, please watch all of the hyperlinked videos that are in the lecture. Again, they give you added information. Oops. Taxonomy. It's the See, taxonomy. All right, the value to classify and stuff, why do we do it? It helps us organize the large number of species into smaller groups. And once you look at the classification, once you can organize them into smaller groups, at that point, you can then have hypotheses. If I know about a mountain lion, I know what a Florida jaguar is going to do because they share a lot of the same characteristics. If I can look at my house cat that always gets in a box, maybe if I give a lion a big box, it'll get in it. And Spoiler, they do in the zoos get in large boxes just like your house cat does. And so once we have a classification, once we have a grouping, now we can kind of extrapolate out what we think is going to happen if we change something in the environment or we look at the physiology. It helps us understand these organisms. The classification is an attempt to reflect evolutionary links. Um, and so we're trying to classify on evolution. Before this classification used to be, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it must be related to a duck. Now we're going in and we're doing the PCR and the gel electrophoresis and we're using protein sequences and amino acid sequences and actually nucleotide sequences to figure out our evolutionarily links. I, that word is like throwing me this morning. I didn't sleep well, sorry guys. <laughs> um, but now we're rewriting our classification. So in the last 10 years, we are actually moving whole groups of organisms around the tree of life. We've come up with whole new groups that we said, oh, you know, we need another group of bacteria because these guys really aren't like the rest of them. When we find a new organism, we not want to name it. And we don't want to use a Latin name. We don't want to use common names. Um, Latin name doesn't matter what country you're in, you're going to get it. So binomial nomenclature was discovered or designed by Carolus Linnaeus. And it's composed of the genus that the organism is in and the species. This is always italics if in typing form or underlined if handwritten. The genus is always capitalized. The species is always undercase. So for example, you guys are homo sapiens. The H in homo is capitalized. The S in sapien is lowercase. It's important that we do this because if you look at this little guy on your picture, this guy in Hawaii is called a mahi-mahi. In Mexico, it's a dorado. In California, it's a dolphin fish. They are all the same organism. So if you're going to do some scientific research and write up about this organism, you want to have a name that is the same no matter where you are, no matter what your location is. Every four years, the International Congress of Zoology meets. And at this point, they're going to look at this tree of life, which is what's on the screen, and kind of discuss, debate whether or not organisms need to be moved. They're going to introduce new organisms into that tree of life. Guys, we are still discovering primates. So there is a lot out there that we don't know. And every year, usually around this time of year, they come up with the list of new discoveries, new organisms that we have found out in the wild. It has also now set the rules for naming. Um, back when I was in college, you could name, if you discovered a species, you could name it whatever you wanted. So I had a grad student he was my lab TA, and he was being asked to leave with his master's. At UCSB, they only give PhDs, but if you're not doing well in the program, they'll say, you know what, here's your master's, enjoy the rest of your life. And he thought he could get in well with the guy that was writing his program if when he discovered this deep sea squid, he could name it after the professor. And he did, he still got asked to leave, but now this professor has a squid named after him. Um, about 10 years ago, they changed the rules. It can no longer be some random name. No uh, Bodie McBoatface. There are seven different taxic levels. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. 
And if you look at humans, you are in the kingdom Animalia, which means you are all animals. Um, you are in the phylum Chordata, which means you have a backbone. You are in the class Mammalia, which means that you produce milk for your offspring. In the order Prima, family Homidae, genus Homo, and species Sapien. Make sure you memorize the order of your seven taxa levels. Um, this does come up on test questions. There are three domains of life. Archaea are single-celled bacteria that live in very extreme conditions. Remember what I said when we got to looking at the PCR and the gel electrophoresis, there was a group we pulled off and set aside. That was this archaea. We think these guys have characteristics of the first things that evolved on Earth. You bacteria are all other prokaryotes. These are our common bacteria. And then eukaryotes are all eukaryotic cells. These are the ones that have membrane-bound organelles. Okay, here's your memorization. You do need to memorize the characteristics of the different major phyla. When we did plants, we went through the plant phyla, but bryophyta are small um, mosses. They grow in moist areas. They don't have vascular tissue. Philophyta are your ferns. And again, they're gonna grow in moist areas, but these are the first ones that are gonna have veins or vascular tissue. And they have spores on the underside that they release. Conifera phyta are your Christmas trees. Um, they produce cones, not flowers, and they don't produce fruit. They're evergreen. And then angiospermata are your flowering plants and they have seeds that become fruit. You have different animal phyla that you have to memorize. Perifa are your sponges. They are asymmetrical. And these guys are almost like colonies where if you put a sponge through a sieve, it will reform. Cnidaria are your jellyfish. They have radial symmetry. Um, they have one opening, so their mouth and their anus are kind of the same thing. Um, and they have stinging cells. So all of your jellyfish are cnidaria. Sea anemones are cnidaria. So your cnidaria have both a sessile, which means they're planted in one place like a sea anemone, or free living, which means they float around like a jellyfish. Platyhelminthes are your simple worms. They're flatworms. They get all of their nutrition through diffusion in and out. These are the guys that are gonna be suction cup to your gut and sucking up your nutrients like a tapeworm. They have one body cavity opening and they're often parasitic. These are our first organisms to exhibit bilateral symmetry, which means you cut it in half and you get two equal pieces. Annelida are earthworms, bilateral symmetry, two digestive tract openings. They have rudimentary aortic arches, so rudimentary hearts, and they are segmented. Mollusca, clams, squids, snails, they have an external shell. Um, octopi also and squid fall into this category. They have a remnant shell, which is internal at this point. Soft, unsegmented bodies, but with two digestive tract openings. Anthropods, largest group on earth. These are your insects. They have an exoskeleton, so their muscles are attached on the inside of the skeleton, and the skeleton is hard on the outside. They're segmented, and they have three pairs of segmented legs. We can take um, an earthworm, for example, and say, I want to find out exactly what kind of earthworm this is, and we can go to a taxonomic key. The key to a taxonomic key is that you have limited choices. So if I dig up my earthworm in Canada and I measure it, it's either going to fall into small, medium, or large. If my earthworm falls into large, I don't look at the first half of this. I'm only looking at the portion here. Now that I know what size my worm is, now I'm gonna look at body color. Is it other colors or is it dark brown, black, red, black, or reddish? If it's pink, it's over here in other colors. So if it's one of these, then I come down and I'm gonna look at the distance between the nose and the start of the sleetium, which is this thick thing. And if it's short, it's this. If it's long, it fun, this is the genus species. So genus species here, genus species here. 
you're going through answering questions and every question brings you to another. It's like a choose your own adventure book if you read those when you were little. And the end point is going to be your genus species. You can find these online or you can go to a bookstore and like Tide Pools of Southern California. I had one and it was about that thick and you would do the same thing through the book. Clade and cladistics are a little more difficult. Um, a clade is again drawing this tree of life. It's a group of organisms that share a single common ancestor and all descendants of that ancestor. Based primarily now on DNA sequences, we used to base it on biochemical evidence and morphological, but DNA really is the best tool for this. Um, the way that you do it is by three basic assumptions. A change in a characteristic occurs over time, i.e. evolution. Any group of organisms is related by descent from a common ancestor, so adaptive radiation here. And there are a branching pattern of lineage splitting with each split creating two groups. Why do we use DNA? It's because the genetic code is universal. We all have the same code, whether or not you're an elephant, a mouse, a cockroach, or a human. And we believe that it was established very early in Earth's history. And so all of our common ancestors share this genetic code as well. We're gonna look at differences in very specific proteins. So we're not going to code the entire DNA sequence of any organism. We're gonna go into a protein that is similar across all organisms, say the protein found in cellular respiration because everything does cellular respiration. We're gonna pull one of those proteins out and then we're going to sequence that protein to find the amino acid differences. And if you look here, the difference between a human and a chimpanzee in cytochrome C is zero. We have the same cytochrome C. You could take it from us into a chimpanzee and it would work the same way. Between us and a rabbit, we have nine. That means that we split from a rabbit much earlier than we split from chimpanzees. Morphological, we talked about this, how we've rewritten with DNA. Um, you can see that this organism here for morphology would have its own branch on this tree. But if we do it from DNA, it shows it actually shares a common ancestor with this organism. Biological clock or evolutionary clock is how long ago we split from that organism. Basically saying that the more differences, the longer it has been evolutionarily since we shared a common ancestor. And then I just want you to watch this whole thing about why the tree of life is so messed up and why this is a great field to go into if this interests you. Constructing a cladogram, um, I'm not gonna read this. I want you to read it on your own because the lab activity that you're doing actually leads you through how to construct a cladogram and how to read it. So make sure you look at this. Cladistics only recognize monophylogenic groups or groups that include a single common ancestor. There are groups out there that don't follow this pathway. There's polyphenetic, which don't include a common ancestor, and paraphyletic, which include a common ancestor, but not all of its descendants. That is it for lecture.